All right. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jim. Uh, okay, thank you. I was about to ask about that one. Um, this is my first talk, so I hope it goes over well. I hope you all enjoy it. This is the anatomy of drug testing. Um, the core of this talk is going to be mainly just um, going over what's tested for, why it's tested for, the specifics of the um, how the tests work as a sciences and stuff like that. Um, now my slides, I don't put a lot of information on them. Honestly, they're just going to be more like notes for me to remember what I'm talking about. Um, I want to start off more on the legal end just so you get an idea of some of the information. Um, scheduling is where drugs are set up at um, on a legal standpoint. Now, schedule one is where you're going to find most of your drugs. Um, pot, heroin, uh, methamphetamines, things of that nature. Um, Schedule 1 drugs are technically supposed to be drugs that are highly addictive, no medical purposes. Um, they are considered to be dangerous to society, things of that nature. It is not legal to own them without DEA approval. Uh, now Schedule 2 have a slight medical advantage but are still highly addicti uh, addictive and dangerous. Um, a weird example of this one would be cocaine is actually a Schedule II drug instead of Schedule I. Um, reason being is cocaine is actually used still as an anesthetic in certain kinds of surgeries. Um, I believe ocular surgeries, they'll still use it on occasion. Um, now Schedules three and four is where you start getting into drugs that are less addictive, they have uh, less social um, context of causing harm to people. Um, they don't cause physical harm. Hot, they're not addictive, things of that nature. Um, you're looking at a lot of, like, say, antipsychotics, um, antidepressant medicine for, like, Schedule 3. Schedule 4, you're, you know, acetaphetamine, salicylates, you know, painkillers of the lower end that you buy at the uh, street, maybe Benadryl, things of that nature. Now, onto the actual legal stuff that matters more is the DOT. Uh, DOT is Department of Transportation. Uh, this is huge when it comes to drug testing because the DOT will mandatory drug test anyone who operates a commercial vehicle. And their rules are where the strictures are. Um, DOT regulations state that the panel has to be at a minimum of a five point panel, uh, usually THC, amphetamines, uh, cocaines, opiates, and I believe it's going to be barbiturates, possibly. Uh, the fifth one can vary from time to time. Um, and some of the rules behind how it has to be done, it has to be done completely illegally with a chain of custody form, a COC form. Um, everything has to be documented properly. The person has to go into a secure location in order to take the piss test. Uh, and with a secure location, water cannot be running. Uh, you are looking at everything that could potentially have a dispenser is going to be taped off so you're unable to use it. The toilet bowl would be blued out so if you bring out the sample and you try to use the toilet water, it's not going to be valid because it will be you know, some kind of sickly green color. Um, and then if the DOT person is coming in for a reason other than, say, a random pre-employment, say there's a recent suspicion, there's an accident, or they're acting a little bit weird, uh, DOT regulations also state that someone in those circumstances is going to have to have an observed collection. Um, first person will have to end up out of their pockets, they'll have to pull their pants down, pull their shirt up, spin around the circle to make sure there is nothing uh, present that could potentially be used as an alternate sample, and then go into the bathroom and still be observed of the year leaving the person's body and going into the sample cup. Um, now there's also non-DOT which is just a still a legally binding but it's not as strict because you're not dealing with the driving on the roads. Uh, Non-DOT you basically just sign your form, you walk in there, it's still a secured room but then you walk back out and you sign in a couple of things. Usually you'll sign the actual container that the urine specimen will be sent into the uh, testing research facility and then you're on your way. Uh, now BATs, uh, breath alcohol, um, same thing, chain of custody, they're not as uh, detailed as the DOT ones. Um, now these are the ones that the hospitals and the police can both use. Um, 
They are also legally binding. Uh, someone who says that the breath alcohol is not as specific or accurate as a, a, a hospital testing, the hospital that I work for actually uses the exact same uh, breath alcohol uh, machine for our BATs as the police departments in the region that I live in. Um, and we are, have been able to test to make sure that our chemistry machines can test the actual BAC directly from the blood as opposed to the um, BAC from the breath and they are right on comparable. Now, the methodology is here. Uh, these four, or five, sorry, uh, methodologies are five of the primary ones you're going to end up seeing are, and they're going to be getting used for your uh, uh, drug testing. Uh, EIA and ELISA is one of your most basic. Uh, what this is, is if you want to think about it this way, think of like a pregnancy test. You piss in a strip and you'll see like a little bit of a uh, water line moving up and if there ends up a, uh, a colored line forming, then you're pregnant. Uh, these work off that same principle. It's uh, working with antibodies and enzymes and things of that nature. What's going to end up having is where that little line is, there's a strip of antibodies attached to the uh, filter. And when the drug, let's just say THC, uh, passes over that line, the THC will bind to those antibodies. Now there's also antibodies that at the very base where you actually put the sample on that are filtered out and those antibodies will bind to a different part of the THC molecule. So what you end up doing is you end up getting this antibody right here and then you have your teeth, this is on the actual cassette, and then the molecule holds on the right here. And then another antibody will grab on the right here. The top of that antibody is made to be colored. So that if all these THC molecules end up attaching, then the colors, uh, these secondary antibodies will attach to that one, creating almost like a sandwich of antibodies and these molecules, allowing there to be a defined line. Um, obviously, if there's a high level of THC or whatever drug you're testing for on there, the line will become very, very uh, thick and dark, whereas there's a very small amount, it would be a very faint line. Um, it's only a quali uh, qualitative uh, test though. I mean, it's not going to give you any kind of definitive number, like you're not going to have, no, you have, you know, 15 milligrams per deciliter of a sample on that one. Uh, for that one, you'll need the other four. Uh, the next one is spectrophotometry. Uh, spectrophotometry is used in actually not only drug testing but is a major testing style of most, uh, well I don't want to say most, but of many of the different kinds of tests that the hospitals will be running. I mean, this thing will test your levels of potassium, it will test your levels of different drugs and also different enzymes and proteins that are found in your blood, urine um, and other kind of body fluids. Now. Uh, the way the spectrophotometry works is you have, uh, well, with where I work, we use what's called a dry slide. It's a, a newer kind of spectrophotometry. Uh, it's just now starting to become increased. And what happens is you take uh, the slide and the machine will dispense, say, like five microliters of specimen. Um, It'll dispense it onto this slide, and the slide will have filters in there to filter out what it doesn't want in there. Um, and then what isn't filtered through would go down to the bottom, which has enzymes. And these enzymes are going to react with these different drugs, and with these reactions, it will change the color, kind of like you know, you add um, iron to oxygen, it goes from clear and gray to a reddish color from the rust. Um, the machine will take this color, it'll um, see how much of a color change there is, how dark it uh, gets, the differences and everything of that nature. And with these different changes in color, it'll actually give a very specific amount of out, um, a level of the drug that's in there. Um, good example that I see a lot is alcohol testing uh, from people coming into an ER. Um, like a point one that I would see would be equivalent to a 0.1% uh, for that. Um, with spectrophotometry, you're looking at a lot of times uh, your alcohols. Um, I believe there's some for cocaine, acetophetamine, salicylates. Um, a lot of the ones that aren't really going to matter too much. Uh, the big one legally is going to be alcohol. That's going to test for. 
Um, now, chemiluminescence as a test. Chemiluminescence uses a similar concept as the EIA and the ELISA. Uh, what chemiluminescence does is it has a base of these antibodies and then the chemicals, the drugs that we're testing for will attach to these antibodies and they're going to be inside a uh, tiny little cuvette. Uh, they get incubated for a while, warmed up to the correct temperature, and then through a series of acids and bases that are being splashed in through this, in through there, it uh, shoots out a bit of light at the cuvette after being washed out these acids and bases, and the molecules that are attached to the other end, instead of being color, are photoreactive, and uh, the machine will measure how much of the pho uh, of this flash of light that is shot at it it will absorb it and then release that light back out. It will find out how much of that light is absorbed and then released back out. And it will actually give a very uh, quantitative result and definitive answer as to how much the person has in their system at that time. Um, now, GCMS, uh, actually you know, I'm going to go in a different order. Uh, I'll go with the breathalyzer first. Uh, GCMS is a lot more advanced. Um, the breathalyzer, simply the way that one works is when you breathe in, uh, show of hands, who here has actually had to take a breathalyzer for whatever reason? Wow, I'm impressed. You people are either very good or just not doing it right. Um, uh, the way the breathalyzer works is, I mean, for everyone who raised their hand, they know that the, uh, you know, the officer in question is always saying, all right, now breathe deep, keep breathing, keep breathing, keep breathing. They don't let you stop giving one breath until the machine goes off. Um, the reason being is that the breathalyzer is specifically meant to wait till the breath is becoming exhausted to start measuring the sample. Uh, what that's doing is that's going to get a deep, long sample instead of one that's upper more toward the surface where it's going to be saturated with alcohol. Um, and that's the other reason why they make you wait, say, 15 minutes, 20 minutes before you give a sample, because so much as eating a sandwich, you know, having a breath mint can actually throw off the results of the test. Sadly, it'll only give false positives. Uh, it really won't get any kind of false negatives. Um, but your body is releasing the alcohol uh, through the bloodstream into your a, um, into your lungs, and that's what they're testing on for that one. Now, uh, GCMS, uh, gas chromatography mass spectrophotometry. Um, for anyone here who's watched CSI, which is sadly probably most of us, um, if you remember seeing where they're like, all right, this person has this drug in and they look at this little strip of paper and it has like these tiny little uh, juts of uh, like spikes and peaks and things of that nature, uh, that's uh, GCMS. What GCMS does is actually two different tests that they use in conjunction because neither one is specific enough to give a uh, definitive result by itself, but when used together, they could piece the information uh, with each other to give a result that is incredibly specific and incredibly accurate. Um, what happens with the gas chromatography is they take a tiny sample and they heat it up to make a, uh, a gaseous form out of it. And then with this gaseous form, they take a, uh, um, a stream of air, usually of a, an inert gas like radion or something along those lines, and shoot it through a uh, coil. Now inside this coil are chemicals that are made to be able to attach to certain enzymes or certain um, chemicals and not to other ones. So these molecules that have been a, um, suspended into a gaseous form start shooting through this line. Now, dependent upon how reactive uh, what chemical is to how reactive the chemicals are to the inner lining of this tube, and depending upon the size, the different chemicals will come out at the end of the coil at different times, and a gas chromatographer uh, will actually uh, end up cre um, creating a list of, okay, it's possibly this one is at this time, this one's at this time, this one's at this time, so these molecules could potentially be this. Now, say like uh, cocaine could have a similar time to pop out as THC. That's the reason why it's unaffected by itself. Now, mass spectrophotometry is, requires a very, very pure sample. It requires um, also the way it works, 
the when it comes out that coil, uh, the mass spectrometer, what it does is it causes the uh, molecules to bust apart and then go on to a, a plate. Now when it hits this plate, it's reading the charges and the atoms that are on there. So say if it takes a complex molecule, say like THC, bust the THC molecule apart, the molecule slams against this plate and it reads exactly what atoms are hitting on this plate and it will create a list of potential chemicals that it could be. Um, but with that, if it has, you know, say 10 carbons, 15 hydrogens, 3 nitrogens and a couple sulfurs, there's hundreds of different possible compounds for that. That's the reason why the uh, gas chromatography works with the mass spectrophotometry photometry because the correlation of when it came out, how react, uh, showing how reactive it was to the coils and what time it got eluded through the entire coil system and matched with the system of knowing exactly what molecules it is, when you put those two together, it creates a very, very definitive idea of what chemical it could potentially be. Um, this is considered the gold standard. This right here, uh, many tests like say like the ELISA can read up to like at the best I've seen I think is like 50 uh, micrograms per deciliter. The GCMS I know can get down to at least five and it will give a de very definitive number too. Um, let's see what's next. All right, now sample types. Obviously most of these you aren't going to be dealing with, uh, well some of these you aren't going to be dealing with. Here's one people really, really get curious about. Um, hair as a standard is not tested past nine months as a standard. Um, I've talked to a few companies and you can get it done past the nine months but you have to give two samples so they'll do a nine month and a full hair sample. Uh, but for the most part they don't do that. And the way they work with the hair is they take the hair sample and they'll dissolve the hair and with this dissolved hair sample, they'll take out the uh, liquid end of it and then run it kind of like they do with the ELISA and EIA. And then if there's a positive, they'll go with a GCMS confirmatory testing. Um, the other important thing about hair is it's deposits of the metabolites that are in there. So say you're in a party, you're a, a bunch of people are smoking some pot and um, you end up getting a hair sample. If you don't smoke, it will not affect you. Even if you were there that night before, you didn't shower, you go in, you're worried that the pot's still in your hair, it won't matter because your body's going to break down the THC molecule to meta different metabolites and that's what actually is getting deposited in the hair and that's actually what's being uh, tested for and not the actual THC itself. Um, urine sample, this is the you know, gold standard amongst most people. Uh, many people here I'm assuming has had to deal with having to take a piss test. They're not fun depending upon you know, the circumstances. Um, <laughs> now the important thing, actually I'll go ahead and get on the, how they test for adulteration on the uh, urines later on. Um, blood is one of the unique ones because it doesn't always test for the metabolites. Like I said with the hair and the urine, they're going to be testing with metabolites instead of testing for the actual chemical itself. Um, but with blood, they're actually able to test for the very specific uh, drug itself if they want to to know if you were actively on it at that point in time. They can also test for metabolites if they so choose. Um, now would you get your blood tested? Do you normally the tube that you'll be seeing them put the uh, sample into is going to be a gray top tube. Uh, there's two different chemicals in there. One of them is just an anticoagulant simply to, just to make it so it won't clot up. Um, the other chemical in there is an anti-metabolite. And the anti-metabolite is going to stop any of the uh, red cells, white cells, etc. from metabolizing anything that's going to be in there, be it glucose or heroin. Um, now I put stool in here because I had a uh, personal friend asking me if there's a way to, you know, fish out someone's septic tank to see if they've been smoking pot. You know, I don't know why they would want to do that. Um, <laughs> but with the stool, technically there's no stool testing. Um, there's a very, very, very defined um, exception to that rule which is called a meconium test. Uh, for people in the medical industry, who aren't in the medical industry rather, uh, a meconium test is a, the first stool sample of an infant. 
Um, I think the reason why these are the only stool samples that are done, now I haven't had this part confirmed, is that an infant's stool is not contaminated by bacteria yet. Um, I mean, people's uh, uh, you know, bowel system is completely just flooded with bacteria, which can change, manipulate all these different drugs, whereas an infant's stool sample isn't going to have that effect. And it brings in a very also major point of a lot of your release of these chemicals, of these metabolites, is actually in your stool, but this gets further broken down in ways your body can't even break it down. Um, also, meconiums are very, very legally binding. Um, I see, I would say, four a month most likely from our OB area from girls who would come in, have a child, she tested positive for whatever drug, they'll test the baby to see if the baby uh, was contaminated by the, blo um, by the drugs. Um, obviously, I've already talked about breath enough, you know, not too big of an issue on that one. Um, that's really just gonna be alcohol testing. Um, now the last one is body fluids and tissues. This is a wide scope right here because it's not very often done. Uh, the most common one would probably be salivary testing. Uh, salivary testing is going to be using the EIA uh, for the most part. It's not really too big. Um, you have the potential of doing sweat testing where they put a patch on you. You have to wear it for so many hours. You take it off. Mm, excuse me. And then they'll take the sweat and try and test it. It's not very common. I didn't really hear about it until I did some specific research just to make sure it wasn't there and it ended up being there. Um, other kind of body fluids is the viscous fluids that is in the eye. A lot of times people will take that and use that to see if the person was under drugs when they were dead or when they died. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then also you could potentially, if you really, really wanted to, use certain kind of body tissues for testing. Uh, the big one would be adipose tissue, you know, fat tissue, uh, for testing with uh, mostly THC or any other kind of fat soluble uh, drug. But you know, THC being the big one on that end. Um, now right here I just have a kind of a, a couple lists of some very, uh, of drugs, of where they kind of stand on drug testing. Um, commonly tested drugs, amphetamines, TCAs, which are antidepressants, oxycodone, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, salicylate, and cetaphidamine. Um, the bottom two, just you know, basic painkillers, your ibuprofen, your Tylenol, things of that nature. Amphetamines can range anywhere from methamphetamines, like say ecstasy or ice, to simple stuff like say Ritalin or even your diet pills are gonna be less leveled as amphetamines. Um, and that's the reason why things like the GCMS come in so importantly is the GCMS will, won't say it's an amphetamine, GCMS will say it's the specific amphetamine and that way they know that you're, you know, you just can't say, oh, I took a diet pill, they'll know that you, you're on crank. Um, <laughs> And then barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and oxycodones. Um, that's mostly is going to be commonly tested for just for uh, therapeutic monitoring. Making sure you're taking your drugs and not someone else. Make sure you're not taking too much of your drugs. Um, there is a lot of money that ends up going into a uh, pain management with the oxycodone. A lot of money that goes into that. Uh, now, commonly tested drugs that are illicit, uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, um, ecstasy, if you did not know, is actually in methamphetamine. The MA is you know, methamphetamine. Um, opiates, PCP, THC. I honestly don't know why PCP is commonly tested for. You don't see it a lot uh, on drug tests, uh, showing up positive. Um, but it is commonly tested for. I really haven't figured that one out, just as a... Uh, conceptual idea. Um, opiates are very, very heavily tested for. I really wasn't sure where to put this as com uh, illicit or, il uh, or illicit, but um, you're looking at a lot of things like, say, morphine and heroin, um, I mean, and ranging from those to just the simple ones that they use as a minor, minor uh, anesthetic while you're, at the, like, say, at a hospital or something. Um, also, important piece of information is certain things like heroin. Uh, when they test for that, your body metabolizes opiates in a very strange way. 
And um, like heroin is actually going to end up getting broken down into morphine and then morphine broken down into something else and then that's something else broken down into something else and there's a long chain. So when you get tested for heroin, it actually may end up showing that you were taking morphine instead or something other uh, or something else down the chain. So they know there was a chance you had one of these opiates, but your, meta- but your body metabolizes these so quickly that they really can't determine unless they get a very, very quick sample on you. Now for uncommonly tested drugs. Um, very, very um, big urban legend is that LSD cannot, cannot be tested in your urine. That is false. Most places do not test for it in your urine. Um, for many reasons. It is not considered a dangerous drug because it's not something you see people, you know, you don't have the crack core equivalent of an LSD head. Um, (laughs) And also LSD comes out of your system so quickly that there's only a very narrow window of time to be able to actually test for it. Uh, I'll get Q&A a a little bit later. Thank you. Um, (laughs) um, But I, I have confirmed that there are hospitals, at least in my region, that do have an LSD on their standard panel. Uh, my hospital, most others don't have it, um, but it is there. Um, psilocybin, like mushroom, uh, uh, psychedelic mushrooms, um, that is also not commonly tested for for the same reasons. Uh, it's not considered a quote unquote dangerous drug. It's out of your system very quickly. Um, and the other thing about it too is that there's no actual metabolites uh, that's actually produced from psilocybin, at least not for the most part. Uh, the drug was discovered be in one of the major ways of shamans in North, uh, upper North America back in the uh, long before the settlers would feed a poisonous mushroom to a horse collect the urine from the horse, drink the urine, and the horse's body would break down all the poisonous uh, chemicals in the mushroom, but leave the psilocybin untouched so they're able to drink the urine and have a spiritual journey from drinking horse piss. Um, We call that beer nowadays. Um, (laughs) DMT. (laughs) Uh, DMT. Uh, That is... A very uncommonly known drug, but a very potent one. It was actually one of the drugs that was listed as a uh, Schedule One when in the nineteen was it nineteen seventy? I think when that a uh, law came pa- uh, when the scheduling all happened. Uh, DMT was actually one of those main ones. Again, it's another. Actually, the next three: uh, DMT, mescaline, and peyote. All of these um, are psychoactive drugs. They are not considered the dangerous ones. Uh, they are out of your system a lot quicker. It's harder to test for them. They're not fat soluble, so they're not gonna stay in your uh, fat cells and be released slowly over time. Um, and the nitrous oxide is also on the same concept, not that it's you know not dangerous or anything, but it's just, it's out of your system so quick that these drugs right here are just really hard to test for because of the time frame that the people are allowed to be able to test for it. Um, it's not reasonable and financially feasible to do it because they're you know not dangerous and they have to catch you so quick it's you know not reasonable to them. Um, now for a fun part. Um, adulteration. This is uh, primarily for uh, urine drug testing. Um, obviously, an observed is they're going to watch you pee to make sure it you know, leaves your penis, goes into the cup. They know you didn't you know, use someone else's sample, things of that nature. Those are not fun. Uh, guys get really pissed off when you have to do that. Uh, now, specific gravity, for those who don't really know what that is, um, the specific gravity of water is 1.00000. You know, continuing on. Um, but water is almost never pure, so water always has a specific gravity that's a little bit higher. Like it would be, you know, 1.0004. It would actually be considered like pure water. Um, but when you get into urine testing, the specific gravity of urine range, normal range is 
1.01 to 1.025 is a standard of what your urine specific gravity should be with all the other uh, factors in there. Uh, different proteins, creatinine, um, urea, and uh, even epithelial cells of the uh, lining of the urethra and things of that nature. So what they're going to do with the specific, gra specific gravity is going to test to see how low it actually is. Uh, the cutoff usually is 0 .005. Or 1.05, uh, 1.005, depending on how specific they want to be with that. Um, if it's lower than that, they can't give a definitive answer on the test, and they will. They can't say you failed it, and that's the important part. That um, what they can do is say that the sample was improper; it was not usable due to due to being too dilute. Uh, it is not legally. Uh, a breach of contract for most companies to have a dilute sample because someone can just pee a lot. I personally, I drink four liters of water a day, or at least I try to, so my urine's basically like water. That's just how mine ends. Some people don't drink a lot of water, so they have a very dark pee. So they really can't use that against you. Now, they're allowed to retest you later on down the road once they get the results a week later, but at that time, you're going to be clean and good to go. Um, now creatinine. Creatinine is a uh, constituent of urine that is heavily tested for. Uh, normally it's used in testing for kidney function. Uh, the reason why it's also used in for the adulteration is because of with the kidney function, they can also test to see how pure the sample of the uh, urine is. Even with flushing out your system, you can still have a higher level of creatinine with a lower specific gravity, showing that your system is used to uh, pumping out that much water. If you exercise a lot more, you'd have a lot more creatinine in there, uh, things of that nature. And then nitrates are an actual uh, adulterant. Um, Nitrates can be in vivo or in vitro, meaning outside the body, inside the body. Um, and what these do is these will help break down uh, the chemicals. So they test for the nitrates to make sure nothing was put in there that is going to um, skew, the uh, skew the actual chemicals itself so they can't be tested for. Um, actually, something I forgot to add to the adulteration is a... Um, what they do when they test for you also is if there's any kind of um, concept that maybe someone took something and decided that they were going to you know, put a little bit of soap in there or a little bit of bleach, and bleach is far more commonly used than you think, um, that is going to throw the specific gravity to such a high level that they aren't going to be able to use it. And also, you're going to be able to smell it very quickly and know that the sample has been adulterated uh, right off the bat. What they will do in that instance, because you'll be able to smell it so quickly, so defined, the person is going to have to stay there legally or they officially failed the drug test. Um, that sample that is adulterated will stay and it will be sent along with a new sample that is, has to be observed with being illegal. Um, they will take both samples, they run them simultaneously and put them with the same report so the person can see definitively that there was a contamination attempt on the sample. Um, I've had to do, personally, I think maybe four or five of these. Uh, they're not fun, and in that instance, usually you want to call security uh, because you will have people trying to fight you, uh, and that's you know, just not fun. Um, now, for, let's see how much time I got have. Wow, I have a lot more time than I thought I was going to have. All right, now for, I'm guessing is going to be the fun part for me. Um, I would like to do a little bit of a Q&A. I saw a couple of people are writing their hands. Um, gentleman, was it like right there? Yes, that's um, definitely a major aspect of it. Um, 
I do not know what the, I don't, like I said, my hospital personally has never used um, L analyzer EIA for LSD, um, which I don't know what their cutoffs are. Usually it's a lot higher, so they aren't going to be detected. Uh, GCMS, though, will be able to detect up those really, really small, uh, minute amounts of the LSD. Um, there's also the fact that some people when they take LSD will take large amounts of LSD, which is also going to be easier to find. Um, but those people are usually a lot more obvious when you uh, drug testing them, too. Um, <laughs> Um, luckily, I've never actually had someone actively tripping on me when I've had to drug test them. Um, I've had plenty of people actively fucked up, you know, brought in by the police. You get a couple of cohorts every here and there. Uh, they're fun ones. Um, but yeah, that's a very, also a very good point, and I thank you for bringing that up. Um, the fact that it's such a small amount is being taken does really weigh in heavily to the ability to test it. Um, it is testable, but that small amount does make it a whole lot harder and that actually does add into the ineffectiveness of actually trying to test for LSD. Ketamine, I can almost guarantee they do. I've never actually seen a panel that included it. Um, a lot of more obscure drugs um, beyond like the standard 5, 10, 12, maybe even a 15 panel, um, they have ways of testing for other drugs. Um, you know, like say ketamine being a good example, but they don't commonly test for them for the simple fact of they're not common enough. Uh, ketamine is actually considered more of a dangerous drug than say like LSD would a lot of times. Um, and what you have to usually do to be able to find out if something can be tested for is just you have to get a hold of a company and look at their log of potential tests to see if they actually do offer that. Um, companies like MedTox and LabCorp are major ones who actually can be able to test for that. Lab, uh, LabCorp being a uh, medical purposes and uh, MedTox usually being for a, um, like MedTox Quest are going to be actual legal. Um, yes? Uh, um, list of foods, we don't deal with that at, like, a, as a collection site. Um, tests now are becoming more and more specific um, and they're becoming more accurate, so we don't have to worry about that as much. Um, I would say about 10, 15 years ago, actually, like I believe it was ibuprofen could cause a false positive for THC. Uh, nowadays it doesn't. They found out ways to get around that. Um, certain foods like you know poppy seeds being a common one with the opiates uh, could potentially give you a false positive. Um, but you have to eat so many of them that it's unreasonable and they can also determine that potentially it could be this concept. Um, also, uh, actually that brings up another concept I uh, forgot to mention, is that if you're on a legal drug and you have to take a drug test, say you're prescribed some hydrocodone because you have some back pain or you, you know, have an abscess tooth or something like that, you don't have to worry about taking your piss test and failing it on that specific chemical because with the drug test there is a what's called an MRO, medical review officer. Um, this MRO, what he will end up doing is he will look over all these positive results and say an opiate shows up and ends up being hydrocodone. He will personally call people uh, or maybe even have a secretary or something like that do it and verify uh, prescriptions to make sure that you're actually legally allowed to be on said drug when it shows up. That way he can give, it was, the drug test will sh still show that you did it and it'll still show a flag of that you quote unquote failed your drug test but there'll be a note along with it saying the patient or the specimen that the carry the specimen was allowed to be on this drug at the time of the collection and um, then they will not have a uh, falsified report. They will not be a failing of the actual test on that instance. Um, green shirt. Yes. Oh, okay.
screened for, let's say, a mom comes in and there's, you know, uncertainties about whether uh, you know, whether she's on drugs or has been on drugs. Usually, what they'll do is they'll screen mom. They'll get mom's urine upon admin to the hospital, and then they'll get baby's first urine, and then the meconium is usually a secondary test uh, for you know, more legal, but we, we rarely use that. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yeah, actually, uh, wow. Uh, the hospital I work with actually, for some reason, I don't know why, it loves meconium. Uh, we've, I, I, I mean, that's just, yeah, oh, trust, oh, I agree, it's a pain in my ass. Uh, it's a serious pain in my ass, because the nurses do all the legal chain of custody forms completely wrong every time, and it's just a hassle beyond belief. Um, but yeah, I mean, we always do a screen with the mother first, um, and then we'll end up going to meconium. We've done a urine, I think maybe once or twice. Um, I think my hospital tried to stray, to try to stray away from it because of the sample quantity. So, but um, I'll, thank you for the confirmation on that, though. And, and it's very messy. My second question was. Yes. Um, honestly, it's going to be varying upon uh, multiple factors. Um, the biggest factor actually is going to be whether the drug is fat soluble. That's the reason why THC is tested for so long after that you've smoked pot, especially with chronic use, is that your body is going to be storing all that uh, the THC metabolites in your body fat, and as your body burns through the fat cycles, it gets slowly released over time. Um, it can range. T, like say THC with being fat soluble, you know, you smoke pot once after having not smoked it for a year, it could be out of your system in two or three days. Um, I have personally seen someone who was demanded by child services to come in and give a urine sample daily to test their THC levels, and he was throwing positives for three months without smoking anything. So he said. Um, <laughs> But that, with him, was a chronic use. I mean, I ended up talking to him quite a bit because him and his girlfriend had come and both do it. And while she was in there, um, he claimed to have smoked nearly half an ounce to an ounce of pot a day by himself for at least six to seven months. And it, that kind of chronic use is what would take to be a test for that long of a time as a positive without actually uh, taking any drugs anymore. Um, oh wait, hold on. Um, but for the other drugs, um, they're in your system for a lot less of a time. Uh, granted, with chronic use, it can be a lot longer. Um, cocaine can have a range of anywhere from a couple days to about a month. Uh, most drugs are in your system for only a few days. Heroin cannot be directly tested after, I think, seven hours because your body metabolizes it so fast, which also lends to its high level of ad uh, addictiveness. Um, and then also your general body chemistry. Some people's body chemistry is they metabolize things faster, so they're going to be out of your system faster. Some people have a slower metabolism, like you know, yours truly. And so for someone like me, I will probably retain a positive result if I were to take something for a lot longer of a period of time. So I mean, it's, you have to, it's harder to tell unless you actually you know, take a drug and then take a piss test, take a piss test, take a piss test, and find out exactly what the half-life is, is it for you specifically. Um, I saw your hand. Uh, in regards to uh, mushrooms and urine, okay. were you referring to uh, psilocybinous mushrooms or amnita muscaria? I thought it was the amnita muscaria because the uh, muscle mom or whatever it is is be psychoactive in, uh, in urine. Hmm. Um, honestly? Uh, yes, he was asking. Uh, there's multiple kinds of mushroom, uh, psychedelic mushrooms. Uh, there's psilocybin, and then there is. Um, can you repeat that one again for me? Amandina. Um, I don't know what the active uh, chemical in that one is. Um, that could be very well. That's only that. Uh, he was asking the difference between those two different kinds of mushrooms. Um, if it's which one is actually the one that is going to be psychoactive in the urine. Um, personally, I forgot to research. Uh, which one it was going to be. Uh, I can look that part up fairly quickly. If you want to talk to me after the uh, speech, get with me. I'll look that up in a heartbeat. Um, I know a couple of really good websites that give that kind of information, too. Um, 
I do know that the psilocybin does get out of your system quickly. Uh, I've had that, I've found ways to have that tested out. Um, the other one, I'm not really too sure. Um, if you find out the location of the mushroom itself, it would be a lot easier because I know they used reindeer. It was like the Inuits and the Eskimos who were uh, highly the ones who did that. Um, yes, you're right there. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Do we see any application for absorbance measurement? Yes. Absorbance. Absorbance? Um, you mean like having something in your system that's going to absorb the drug? No, 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 no. It's, it's measured how much blood, how non transparent is the sample, and then how much absorbance is just one another phenomenal measurement. Um, yeah, I'm having a hard time understanding the question. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Is, huh? Okay. Okay. Sorry, I, it's, I, I had a hard time understanding. Yes. Yeah. Um, right there. Um, the B vitamin you're referring to is called a uh, niacin. Um, for niacin to actually be effective, you don't want to take it. Uh, niacin puts your liver into like an overdrive. It causes your liver to start burning fat at a faster level. Um, but for the niacin to actually, you know, potentially work, you're going to look at potential liver damage from your liver going into overdrive too much. And I, personally, I don't think it would be even close to worth the risk. Uh, liver damage is going to be, for the most part, irreversible uh, from that, especially if you do it over and over again. Um, as with dilutions, um, as I was like saying before, if you give a dilute specimen, they can't say you failed the drug test. They can say they couldn't use it due to being dilute, um, and then they can test you later on for that, give, buying you more time. Um, but they actually can't say that you actually got a failing on there. Um, now, for, as for the antioxidants, that's not always going to really work because your body can take care of a lot of those on its own. Uh, and they really won't be affecting the drugs as much. If not really, um, if you really, really, you would have to eat a huge quantity. Like if you're drinking tons of water and you put in tons and tons of salt and, and along with it, uh, you could potentially do it that way, but that is going to put a lot of stress on your kidney to have all those extra salts uh, and along with that. Um, that could potentially raise the specific gravity, but it really won't be enough to actually give a uh, high enough level. There's still going to be a tell that it's very clear. And it's also, that's the reason why they have the creatinine in there too, is they take a test for the creatinine and go like, oh, the specific gravity is a little bit higher, but there's almost no creatinine in there, which means either this guy has no kidney function or he just drank a bunch of salt water. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, the lights are very blinding, so. Oh, okay, 113. Okay. Ooh, that's a good one. Um... You say there are uh, a lot of ketones is what they are popping out? Yeah, so a high level of ketones coming out of the breath and or urine? Honestly, I don't see that being a major adulterant. Uh, they, yeah, I, I really don't see that being... Yeah, the ketone, ketones and alcohol have a very, very similar structure, um, but the reactivity is different. Um, these tests are made to ver work with a very, very specific um, 
in a way that even different kinds of alcohol, like even one extra little bit of a chain on the alcohol is going to cause it not to be a false positive. Um, like rubbing alcohol, if you drink that, is not going to cause you to have a, a higher BAC due to the testing because it's a different kind of alcohol. Uh, just the, the very simple rearrangement of the molecules make a giant difference as to whether it will be a positive or negative result. All right. Um, the gentleman said that uh, I have – my time is up. Uh, there is a Q&A room. Uh, where is that at? 113. 113? All right. Um, I will be there in a couple minutes. I'll break down my stuff. Thank you.